on this episode of the Oklahoma Breakdown with Iker and Lehman, presented by Riverwind Casino. We bring you the latest updates on the OU Tulane game and give you some important OU personnel updates. In the National College Football Roundup, we recap week zero, including Nebraska's loss to Illinois, and we finish up by giving you our winners and losers of the weekend. Please download and subscribe to the podcast, rate it five stars, and write us a good review. Follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search Oklahoma Breakdown on any of those, and you'll find us. All right. Our man, Michael Hosty will kick this thing off. It's time for the Oklahoma Breakdown. It's a beautiful Monday, August 30th, and you're listening to the Oklahoma Breakdown with Iker and Lehman, presented by Riverwind Casino. Riverwind is Oklahoma City's premier casino experience, and your health and safety are Riverwind's number one priorities. There are so many reasons why Riverwind is consistently voted OKC's number one casino, but it all starts with their amazing variety of gaming thrills and excitement. Riverwind's beautiful award-winning environment plays host to more than 2,800 of the latest electronic games with a huge selection of table games, including blackjack, blackjack match, roulette, and Teddy's favorite, craps. No matter what your game, Riverwind has it in spades and hearts. And Fridays in September from 6 p.m. to midnight, you can win your share of $80,000 in cash and bonus play in Riverwind's $80,000 Blitz and Bucks promotion. Love that name, Blitz and Bucks. Drawings are every 30 minutes. If you need help finding your way, just visit Riverwind.com, Riverwind Casino, simply the one. Now we're recording this Sunday night. Please leave us a five-star review and a nice comment. While you're at it, Ted, this is, this is what I envision for the season because would you look at that? Hey, it's game week, baby. It is game week, but here's, here's the plan that we've come up with people. So Monday episodes will be recaps of OU games and the best games around the country. And then Thursday episodes will be previews of OU's game that week and the best games around that around the country that week that it, it sounds simple in my head does that is that's the plan we're going with right preview review that's what we're doing baby oh I like that preview then review and of course we'll 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 work in some of the funny stories uh, whether it's sports pop culture whatever we'll we'll keep doing winners and losers for each episode so that we can have a little fun dude i we don't have time to waste right i mean we got a <laughs> lot to get to and it all starts with the updates for OU Tulane okay first and foremost our thoughts and prayers are with everyone in the state of louisiana as Hurricane Ida damages that state. Uh, watch the Weather Channel all of Sunday. Watching that stuff, man, it's scary. It's scary. The winds, the rain, all the power being out, you know, people in hospitals, especially what they got going on with COVID down there. Like, it's just, it's a bad, bad mix, man. But clearly the safety of everyone there is the most important thing. But there is supposed to be a football game played there on Saturday. So that's, we, we talk about football in this podcast, wanted to make sure Ted, that everyone in Louisiana knows that we care about them before we just go right into what's going to happen with this football game. Yeah. It does feel weird sometimes whenever there's some uh, big things in the world going on and we're talking about sports, but obviously uh, we know about those things. We care about those things, but we talk about what we talk about here and that's football. Yeah. We, uh, we can't, we keep it pretty laser focused on the whole football thing. So <laughs> here is what we know. I think at this point in time, Ted Tulane's team, they have left new Orleans. They are in Birmingham, Alabama, where they are practicing and meeting and preparing for this football game. And after talking to a, a couple of different people in the Tulane program, the only contingency plan that their staff has really been briefed on is the game being in Norman, right? So I know there were some things floating out around there, you know, Hey, neutral site, something like that. It, it does sound like this game is getting played at Yulman stadium, Tulane stadium, 
or it's being played in Norman. I, I don't see it being played anywhere other than those two locations, right? Yeah, I, that's that's what I've heard, and that's what I kind of thought was going to happen all along. The neutral site deal doesn't really make sense. I mean, there's a bunch of reasons as to why uh, you would play it just in Norman or down there at Tulane. This is a, um, you know, it was a two for one situation. They come here twice. We go down there once. So, I mean, I, and I don't know if this would be discussed or not, but worst case scenario is they come here and then in our future meeting, we go down there, um, you know, and just kind of flip those around. I don't know if that works with the TV partners. I don't know if that works contract wise, but it at least makes some sense. And, you know, I, 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 it doesn't make a lot of sense for one of the universities not to benefit from hosting the game. Right. If we're talking about two like competitive football teams that are really close and on the same level. Okay. I can understand a school not wanting to give up home field advantage and would want to play it at a neutral site, but that's really not the case here. And I know Tulane wants to win the football game, but they have to be realistic with that as well. Right. Right. And you mentioned the TV partners after having a couple conversations, this is a decision that is going to be made by OU and Tulane together. ESPN staying out of it. They're staying out of it. They they've decided, Hey, you guys, you guys pick where the game's going to be played. Our people will be there. Just pick it quickly, please. Let us know. Has probably yes. there. Yes, but another interesting thing that I was told was that OU's hotel, you know, where we're supposed to stay down in New Orleans, does not have a source of backup power. Now, that's that's not to say they they couldn't get a generator. Normally, when things things are going on, a bunch of generators show up, things like that. But as of now where the traveling party is supposed to stay does not have backup power, which clearly can be an issue with the power issues that appear to be coming with hurricane Ida. So that I don't know how significant that is, Ted, but I know one thing we're not going down there. If we're supposed to stay somewhere without power. I know that. Right. Well, here's the other thing too. It's not just as easy as moving hotels because that place is about to be flooded with utility workers, like all kinds of people going down that help fix that infrastructure and stuff. And they're going to be posted up in hotels all over the place. So it's not going to be easy just to, to switch venues for Oklahoma this late in the game. Yeah. Last thing for the OU two lane game. OU does have plans in place for the game to be in Norman. Clearly it would be, it would be silly for them not to, but it does sound like a decision will be made by Tuesday. As, as far as the challenges go for having a spontaneous game in Norman, right? You know, people think about, hey, how, how do you get tickets distributed? All, all of that stuff, you know, parking, all of that stuff. I don't think that's that stuff's really the issue, Ted. It, it sounds like the biggest issue is finding people to work the game on such short notice, right? Yeah. People to scan tickets, work concessions, work security, like that type of thing. I think that is the biggest obstacle, but from everything I've heard, it sounds like the leadership at Oklahoma is very confident that they can get that done. Yeah. Yeah. Not easy. I mean, you're talking about mobilizing a, pretty massive workforce and pre preparing the the stadium and the areas around it for a football game. It, it's not just, it's really the preparation for the football game isn't anything. It's preparation for the 85,000 people that are going to pour in there um, and all the things that comes with that, the parking and the security and all that stuff. So it's a huge workforce and I, it's tough right now. It's tough to get, I mean, there's shortage of workers in pretty much every, you know, every field out there. So I know that's difficult, especially with short notice, but I think they can get it done. I, I, there's, there's a lot of other interesting things too. It's like trying to get, like if you're new Orleans, getting your flight, your charter flight, 
your uh, hotel rooms and stuff booked. I know they could do it, but there's a lot of logistics going into moving a football team. Like both teams, like kind of flipping what they're doing. It's it's interesting. I I will volunteer my house to host. Two lanes offensive line. That's it. I don't want any of the skill players. I just want the O-linemen and their O-line coach, Chris Watt, who was in my draft class, played at Notre Dame. He's a great guy. I got to know him throughout the pre-draft process. I will have Watt and his linemen. That is it. That's where I draw the line. Now, they have to take care of my son during the middle of the night. That is the agreement, Ted. Yeah. But it, they, they have to learn it. They have to learn it sometime. This is... I, I will pay them in life experience. That is invaluable education. You cooking breakfast? It is 11 a.m. Uh, kick, so you're going to be up and up pretty early. I will pay someone to cook breakfast. <laughs> I will not do that myself. Could you imagine having to cook breakfast for all those big dudes? That no. would be. Whew. But yeah, I think I don't know where to put it, like from a percentage standpoint, but. I would say at the very least it's 50 50 at this point in time. It does sound like that this, this decision really is going to depend on what the damage looks like from that hurricane. Uh, I mean, I think that it, it's very, very difficult for them to predict it, but Tuesday is sounds, sounds like when things are supposed to be settled down in the new Orleans area from the storm, I don't know how quickly you can assess everything, right? The stadium, you know, lodging, all of that stuff. Like, I, I don't know. It, it seems unlikely that you would play a game after a hurricane, but I, I, I don't know that it's, are you surprised they haven't made the decision to move it shocked. already? I'm shocked. They didn't make the decision Friday. Um, you know, but I get it. I mean, that's a big game for Tulane to host. Right. I can understand that they want to host it, but here's the thing, man. It doesn't make any sense to, to force the issue and host the game. Whenever a lot of your fans aren't going to be able to go, they're going to be dealing with, you know, flood issues or uh, damage to their house issues. It, it, they're going to be, you think of how hard it is for Oklahoma to staff a football game. How hard is it going to be? down there with people dealing with those type of issues and stuff. So quite frankly, I would say that there's no reason that football game should be played down in new Orleans, but I get it. I mean, I, I get it. It's a big game for them. They want to host it, but if I was them, I would try and switch it to where I can host that game, whenever we can get the most benefit from it. No, I can, I, I completely agree. And selfishly, I don't want to go down to new Orleans when it's just been hit by a hurricane. Like I, I, I think so many OU fans were excited for this game because they wanted to go down and enjoy new Orleans. Right. And yep. it's just, it's not going to be the same. I mean, it's just not right. Right. After it gets hammered by a hurricane. So we've talked a lot about that game. Just a reminder. <laughs> we care about the people there. Everyone in Louisiana, please stay safe. We are thinking of you. We are praying for you. We just kind of hope the game gets moved to Norman. That's all we're saying. That's that's all. I don't think that makes us bad people, Ted. I don't think it does. No, I think I, I would think that they want to get it moved to Norman as well, but I, I don't know. I could be wrong about that. Yeah. So our, our preview of the OU two lane game will come on Thursday's episode where the one and only Dusty Dvorak will yes. join us. He will be on the call for ABC. And for those of you that are day one rider dies, he used to be on this podcast. <laughs> Fun fact. Yeah. And he, which, you know, by the time we do the preview, we're, we're going to know where the football game is. Um, he'll, Dusty will know as well. We'll have some, uh, obviously, some great insight from him gearing up for the game, calling it, which is really cool. Um, so, yeah, that's going to be exciting. Going to be fun. Yeah, we'll be talking about Michael Pratt, the quarterback for Tulane, instead of where the game's going to be and the power situation in New Orleans. Okay, so, some OU updates. Dad, got a very important question for you. Okay. What would you say is your favorite memory 
of Trey Bradford's time at OU? Probably whenever I first heard that he was transferring here, because <laughs> that's about the only thing that I can remember of his tenure. Other than a brief little practice note where you said he looked really, the coaches said he looked really good the first day or two. That's probably the only two things I have to choose from. <laughs> I believe, remember, someone told us he was fast as shit. That was cool. Right. Yeah. But, yeah, that. How Okay, so, and once again, hey, Trey Bradford, do whatever you want to do, man. It's your choice. It's your career. You do whatever you want to do. No judgment here. But can you recall a guy transferring and then, like, Two months later, three months later, three months later, transferring back to where he just transferred from. No, I can recall a guy almost doing that, Eric Gilbert, the tight end they lost. Remember, he was gone, and then there was rumor that he was, maybe he's going back to LSU, but he ended up um, not doing that. But, yeah, it's interesting. It's I, I was unsure like, if that was – if he was even able to do that when the, the transfer was official and if Oklahoma, if they really wanted to could put their foot down and say, Nope, you're going to lose a year of eligibility if you do that. But it sounds like it's all legit. He's still within his window to do it. Uh, and honestly, I don't, I don't know that it's worth it to, to fight it that bad. The kid doesn't want to be there. He doesn't want to be there. So uh, very weird though. It's odd. I don't know what would compel someone to do that especially not just the fact that he he's only been here for two months, but I think the biggest factor is this is the perfect opportunity for him. You know, he's the guaranteed number three, which maybe he already was before the Marcus major situation. But I mean, we've seen it a, a ton of times here at a bunch of different receivers that a guy goes down, a guy has an off week, a guy fumbles, you never know what it is. You find yourself out there and you you have a good productive day. Lincoln's going to go with a hot hand and, and put you back in the rotation. So I don't know. I thought it was strange, but a lot of strange things happen with these uh, 18 to 22 year olds. Yeah. So you look at, you look at the running back situation now for the Sooners. I, I would describe it as not ideal. Now, Eric Gray's a stud. Kennedy Brooks is a stud. Jay Knowles, a.k.a. Weatherman Jay, let's go. Give give the meteorologist some carries. I, I think, I actually do think Knowles and maybe some of the other walk-ons could see some time, especially in the first couple of games. But the, the more I thought about it, Ted, looking at how thin they are at the position, Jeremiah Hall is a guy that Lincoln Riley really trusts. We know that he, he speaks so highly of him and Jeremiah Hall was a guy that made a lot of big plays, mostly in the passing game last year. But I think when the Sooners get into some more competitive games, right? Getting into Nebraska, getting into conference play, I would not be surprised to see Jeremiah Hall at the running back position in short yardage, goal line, those types of situations, because I think Lincoln trusts him to do it. I I, I think he's going to be a bigger piece of this offense now. There's no doubt in my mind. I agree 100%. It is interesting, though. Here's whenever you know you have a good football team. Whenever everyone is panicked, about a third team running back, you know, because whenever you really look at things, we still got our number one and number two guy. Uh, And we've got a a whole group of skill position guys that can factor in. And it's a good thing. It's a good thing that we're worried about the third team running back. We're not worried about what's our quarterback going to be like, or uh, is our secondary going to be any good? Are we going to have a pass rush? Can we protect the quarterback? It's like, well, who's going to be the third team running back whenever we're beating people? Who's going to carry the ball in the fourth quarter? Um, I think we're still sitting in a great spot. Yeah, it would be better to have uh, a known commodity at that spot. But, hey, I think we're going to be just fine. 
you're right, Jeremiah Hall is athletic enough, trustworthy enough that I think he could step in specifically late in games. But we've also got a ton of players on this roster, um, skill guys now, skill guys, um, you know, even on the defensive side of the ball, guys that have carried the football a ton in high school. So I'm not really too concerned. Now, we take an injury to one of the starting two. Okay, now you've got my attention. Yeah, I, I think that would be that would be a very very interesting development. If and man, there's always attrition at the running back position, and we've seen it here in the recent past. So you look at things Lincoln Riley may be able to do. I I wouldn't. I wouldn't be surprised to see OU get into some sets, right? Because how, how much of your two back set are you going to use, right? When you really only feel great about the two guys, maybe we see some more big personnel groupings with Jeremiah Hall and Braden Willis and Austin Stogner, and you see them get creative out of that personnel grouping. Maybe we see you know, Mario Williams, Marvin Mims, those types of guys get more touches in similar concepts, right? Maybe you throw them some more swings out of the backfield. Maybe you get them the ball on jet sweeps, those type of plays. Like there, there's all kinds of different ways you can get creative with it. It's just, it's going to change the way that Lincoln Riley has to operate offensively. It's got to, right? Yeah, I mean, he, in the back of his mind, and it's not like it's going to consume his thoughts or anything, but in the back of his mind, he knows he's only got two, you know, really good players at running back. And that's all he's got. Yeah. That's, that's not a situation he's been in very often, but we've seen him do it in the past. Right. So we'll, I can't wait to see how he adjusts to it. Yeah, I know. It's, it's interesting because, we've been so good running the football and that's really been the talking point all off season, right? Is how, how good are we going to be running the football? We need to get back to where we're running it over 200 yards a game. But you know, a lot of those yardage you get in the running game are not garbage time, but four minute offense. You got a multi uh, score lead. You got the ball in the fourth quarter and you're just here. It comes, you're running it right at them. And we usually have, a third physical back. That's our closer. We don't have that now. Um, is he going to find that guy and stick with that, that formula that we've had over the past several years, or is he going to change the way he, he calls the game? My guess is he's going to find that, that third guy. It, you, if you don't want to, and I, I jet sweeps, uh, the bubbles, smoke, stuff like that. I got no problem with that, but it's not a good way to close out a football game. You know, downhill right out of defense is the best way to do it. And that's why I think Jeremiah Hall makes a lot of sense. Yeah, uh, I guess we'll have to we'll have to wait and see. OK, so after some developments, I think a name that Sooner fans should familiarize themselves with is Robert Conjol. And I think I'm saying that right, but I don't know 100% that I'm saying, I don't know if it's Congel or Conjol. I'm going with Conjol. So to the Conjol family, if that's not how you say it, my apologies. The pronunciation guide has not come out yet. I'm sorry, but he is, he's a transfer from Arizona there in the offensive line room. He started a lot of games at Arizona has played a lot of college football. He can play guard and can play center. And he just might play a significant, significant role this week. At running back? Yes. No. Yes. <laughs> we How funny would guy. that be? Here you go, Conjol. Tote some carries, big fella. <laughs> How about that? That's pretty interesting. Now, this is a guy that we heard Beat and Bo talk about quite a bit early on. And for whatever reason, it just hasn't been a name that's that's been out there a whole lot through through the summer and through training camp, but making a late push. I like it. Yeah, I think Conjol, man, I really hope I'm saying that right. I'm gonna feel so bad if that's not how you say it. 
Should I just switch it up? Like Congel, Congel. Hit both of them. Just yeah. hit both of them. Like, Congel feels right. It feels Congel, right. Congel, yeah. Okay. I'm, hey, I'm fine Do with that. you disagree? Now you're, now you got me second guessing it. I think it would, Congel would be C O N G L E for me. That yes. would be Congel. So Congel does make sense. Congel is what we're going with. Final answer. <laughs> But I think he, he is one of those guys that they felt really good about, you know, having, if he was a reserve and having to play in spot duty, they felt good. Like it's just a guy that's played a lot of snaps, you know, started a bunch of games for Arizona. So some situations have developed and guy might have to play. So they, they feel, they feel fine about it. I think so. It's it's not ideal, Ted, and I feel like I'm going to keep saying that. <laughs> but but it it is what it is, man. It is what it is. But you look on the defensive side of things, and this was something I thought was interesting, Teddy. So we got those high high expectations, right, for that defensive line, and we're talking about that unit being one of, if not the best in the country. Perrion Winfrey is clearly a key player for that defensive line, but he was banged up at the end of training camp. He is fine now, but it sounds like him being out gave some more guys opportunities. And I'm told they have added even more depth to the interior defensive line. They feel they feel better about even more guys now, Ted, because they've gained more confidence. They played at a high level in practice after getting those reps. And I have I I don't know how many interior dudes are going to play, but it's a lot, dude. I fully expect to hear Grinch's interview, uh, you know, on Monday or or whenever gearing up for the game and he says yeah yeah we expect to play 27 guys on the defensive line this week uh he's just going to throw out a huge number he said 14 originally and i think that's i don't know that they're going to honestly play 14 guys but they're going to have a deep rotation and you've heard good things about seriously every guy that's that's on that that group you've heard one time or another that they've had a nice day a nice week uh shown some really good flashes so I think everyone's gotten more consistent and you're right. They've, they've got enough talent there. Um, whenever I got that's, that's the, the great thing about having depth and developing depth like this defensive staff has. And I know Winfrey was just, you know, precautionary stuff missing, but whenever you do miss a really good player, if someone does go down, you, you obviously miss them, but, the the loss of production isn't nearly as severe and you can make up for it with depth. And that's, it's incredibly important in a long football season. Yeah. And I, I'm not trying to say that sometimes coaches want to see the good players go out during camp, but when that situation does happen and you see the guys behind him respond in a really positive, positive way, that's very encouraging for a coaching staff. No, I agree. hundred percent. You got anything else, OU wise? No, not really. Um, I know it's going to be an interesting week of preparation. You know, there's there's these games where Tulane is a bit of an outlier that they're going to do some different things that you don't see the rest of the year. Uh, so that can make things a little bit more difficult. So I'm sure uh, the week of preparation is going to be a little bit different. I'm sure they've probably worked on it some through training camp some of the option stuff that you're going to see with them. Um, it can be frustrating, but it can also turn you into a more well-rounded football team and kind of change up the, the season a little bit. It's everything's so streamlined now. Almost everyone runs the same system, at least uh, to some degree. So whenever you have a bit of change up, like you're going to get from Tulane, it can be refreshing. Yeah. You look at the, the new coordinators there that, Somehow coached, they coached in the bowl game. So you've got that to look at then, you know, the new offensive coordinator there, Tulane, Chip Long, he was part of the Tulane staff, but then went to Notre Dame. So do you go look at some Notre Dame film offensively? Then the defensive coordinator they've got this year with just a Duke. 
he is I, I is he gonna run because they're what they ran in the bowl game is not very similar to what they ran at his time at Duke. So you just have to you have to do some guessing, man. That's just it. Yes, yeah. It usually takes a half to to figure out what, what actually they're doing. And some teams that are really good in the first game or two, they'll show you a couple of different things in both halves, you know, and they'll save some things. So whenever you go in to make your adjustments to what you think they're doing, they come out and flip flip the script on you a little bit. So it is tough, but luckily that's where on defense, you can keep it basic, go with your rules, rely on your athleticism to make plays. Yeah, I think I got it mixed up. I think the defensive coordinator was on the two lane staff. I don't know. I don't know. I'll do that. That's for next episode. Yeah. We're not watching this a is lot not of preview lane. mode yet. Okay. Calm down. Okay. It's not, it's not preview. It's not really review, but it is, it's somewhere in between. I don't know. I got lost. What's happening. <laughs> I'm blacked out. Okay. For a call your shot. We just, we asked you guys just for, you know, questions, questions you might have about, OU heading into the year. Thought this one was interesting. Ted, it comes from Brian Grittner. What a last name, Grittner. He says, how much of a benefit would an extra home game be for a team long-term? I don't know about long-term, but it's there's definitely a big benefit to it. I mean, you don't have to travel. You are comfortable going into the game. I, I, I do think there's value on going – going on the road early in the season, especially against a bad football team. But just so you get that process down for the season and you get comfortable with that process with the cupcake game, but it's never bad to have more home games, I suppose. Well, I think it's always great to open at home. Um, opening on the road is, is weird, especially for young guys, right? Uh, whenever the, cause road games are different, your schedule's a little bit different. Um, and with all of the first, like the first time flying on the team charter and the first time checking into the hotel and going to meetings in the hotel and, you know, figuring out who your roommate, there's a bunch of firsts. And whenever all those things are happening, you're worried about that. And you're not worried about the football game. So uh, it's, I think it's always better to open at home to get all of the first game stuff behind you and, and then kind of settle into the season a little bit, at least, you know, one or two weeks before you take a road trip. But, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it really shouldn't matter. The, I think the biggest benefit of an extra home game is I think this is a great lifeline to um, all of the campus corner and the people around the stadium where – it's been a rough go the last several years with home games. You had COVID, you have 11 a.m. kicks, and I know it's still going to be an 11 a.m. kick, but to get that added weekend of revenue for some of those restaurants and bars near campus, that's that's probably the biggest benefit of everything. Yeah. Okay. This one comes from Chuck Westerhide Jr. What a name. How about that? At SD Sooner. He says, will the lack of running back depth change the way Lincoln Riley calls plays? Will he pass more or use tight ends and H-backs to supplement the lack of running backs? We kind of hit on that earlier, earlier, but I think that's a good question from Chuck Westerhide Jr. It's, it's certainly going to force Lincoln to do some different stuff, right? I mean, I, I think it just has to. When you are that thin at that position, there, there's no doubt you're going to game plan around that a little bit. I, I don't think you can be too worried about it because, you you know, football is football. You have to let the kids go out there and play. You can't be scared that someone's going to get hurt. I mean, you just can't approach the game that way. But uh, I do think he'll probably assess the roster and go, okay, who are our best players? How can I get them on the field in creative ways when I only have two running backs? I, I think that's that's something he's probably thinking about every single day since Trey Bradford left. Like he's in the lab thinking, okay, how can I get creative with Jeremiah Hall, with Willis, with Stogner, uh, with the, that depth they have at wide receiver. So I certainly think it 
it has to change some things. Yeah. Here's what's interesting. I don't think it will change anything against Tulane, against Western Carolina. Right. Hopefully against Nebraska. We'll get to them. Right. I I think that these games where we have a, like a major mismatch that he's going to run the heck out of the football late to try and figure out if, do we have a third guy that we can rely on? And as that develops or doesn't develop, then whenever you get into your tougher games, you could see a change, but early on, he's probably going to run it more than he would have before to try and see if he's got that guy or if can he develop that guy in the early part of the season? Cause ultimately I know he wants to be able to run the ball in, in, in tough games when you've got a lead late, you want to be able to, to run the football. And I know he's got his two guys, but it would be nice to lean on a third back later in a football game when a defense is worn out and you know, you don't want to, you don't want to expose your, your two guys to any more reps than they need to. So I think early on, whenever he's got the ability to, because of probably some big separation in the score, he's going to lean, he's going to try and develop that third back. Yeah. And I, I do wonder what it means for Spencer Rattler's contribution to the running game. It hasn't been, it, we didn't see a lot of it last year, but maybe now it, he showed some wiggle. Don't get me wrong. At times you're like, okay, look at, okay. He can, he can run a little bit, but I wonder if this forces Lincoln to get him a little more involved in the running game. I'm not sure that's something Lincoln wants to do with Rattler, but it's, I'm, I'm sure it's something he's considering. Caleb Williams. Kid can run. We've seen it. I mean, there's no doubt. And that's, that's not a bad way to use backup quarterback. Yeah. We saw him do it last year with Chandler Morris, who's the third team guy. And apparently this Ralph Rucker dude can go a little bit. Awesome name, which is probably the most important part. You're, the third string quarterback has to have a badass name. And R- Ralph Rucker is, it is a perfect third string quarterback name. I love it. Yep. No, I, I, I would think that you you have something for Caleb Williams just to keep him engaged. And if it turns into like something that's a dangerous threat, he may always have that there for interesting situations. But I don't think it would ever be anything that they would run enough that you would say that, well, that is supplementing for the uh, the lack of that third back. Yeah. But we'll see what Lincoln does. If there's one thing that man is good at, it is getting his playmakers to football. So yeah, at the end of the day, I don't think you would ever want to run your quarterback more to keep from getting your running backs hurt. You know what I'm saying? It's kind of yeah, like, no. we're not, we're, I just, we're going I'm just saying a sprinkle, here. just a spritz, <laughs> right? Just a spritz to keep you run game. Right. All right, let's get to the national college football roundup. But first let's talk money. First Fidelity Bank is a full-service financial institution based in Oklahoma with tailored solutions for all your personal and business needs. Checking accounts, saving accounts, home loans, and much more. They do it all. Whether it's online banking from your computer or mobile banking from your phone, everything is stress-free with FFB. Making mobile deposits, paying bills online, and moving money to different accounts could not be easier. First Fidelity Bank also provides free ATMs worldwide, making banking convenient wherever you are. They also give back to the community. FFB donates a total of more than $500,000 to local charities and educational foundations. Make your life easier and go bank at First Fidelity Bank. Visit ffb.com for more information and send your kids to Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School. Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School has a long tradition of educational excellence with a 12 to 1 student to teacher ratio. No student is overlooked. Bishop McGinnis's college prep curriculum offers 22 AP courses. There are numerous clubs and organizations for students to join. And as a proud member of the OSSAA, there are 14 sports offered. If you want to provide the best possible educational and spiritual development for your children, contact Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School or visit bmchs.org. Financial aid is available. Nebraska lost to Illinois. 22 to 30. Illini, a lot of mistakes. 
for Nebraska. And, and, and there's always mistakes in game one, right? The, the, everyone's, everyone's got their mistakes in game one. But you don't see a punt returner fielded at the one very often and then go backwards into the end zone, realize he messed up, and then toss the ball out of there. That was, I'm not going to lie, it was hilarious. I laughed out loud when that happened, Ted. But they missed two extra points, a guy that is was the all Big Ten kicker last year and probably made some very, very, I, I what, mortal enemies? <laughs> that too strong? <laughs> no, not too strong. For those of you that don't pay attention to sports gambling, the uh, the over under was fifty two and a half. Thirty plus twenty two is fifty two. Nebraska's kicker missed two extra points. There are some very angry people that had the over. They committed a rough of the roughing the passer penalty that negated an interception that was a huge play in that game. And the guy that did it actually taunted the quarterback, so that tacked on another fifteen. So it ended up being a thirty yard penalty. Their veteran quarterback, Adrian Martinez, fumbled for a scoop and score right before halftime. They ran a QB sneak on first and 10, which honestly is the first time I've ever seen that happen. And Illinois didn't make any of those mistakes. Ted, did I sum, did I sum up Nebraska's afternoon well enough? Uh, yeah, I think you got most of them in there. Those are just, and, and that's just the mistakes that are glaring. Like, like glaring on field decision making they, mistakes. That's not talking about guys that, you know, missed a block here, or missed a protection there. Like they could not just, get lined up defensively. Yeah. I took pictures. If you uh, go look at my Twitter, like when, when Illinois went into their two tight end personnel packages, Nebraska could not get lined up. And Illinois could have sat in 12 personnel and run outside zone every single play. If they wanted to the, the angles that Nebraska's defense, the leverage that Illinois was given in those concepts blew my mind. Like I couldn't believe it. I was was like, why are they doing that? Why are they lining up like that? Oh, they'll adjust. They never adjusted. It was unreal. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. You know, honestly, it's sad that Nebraska is, is where they are and, and they've been there for so long. Obviously, I, I think a lot of people would agree college football's better whenever programs like Nebraska are good. But Nebraska is a school that is going to have to win with details. They're not going to win with talent. They used to win with talent. Now they're going to have to win with details. And you can't win with details whenever you get all of the details wrong. How many times do you think the kid's been coached not to catch it inside the eight as a punt returner? It's a rule of thumb. It's a constant. And it hasn't changed, you know, ever in football. You don't catch it. in. I mean, some teams will be on the 10 or 9. But eight is usually as deep as anyone goes. Your heels are on the eight. You don't take a step back at all to catch the football. And then once you make the mistake, you try and compound it and turn a two-point mistake into a seven-point mistake by throwing the football out of the end zone or whatever you're trying to do. I, these, are, these are things that Nebraska has to master if they ever want to win. And I don't know what they've been doing. It's not that hard to figure out that that's – that's got to be the way that you win football games is with details and they suck at details right now. That's not a good place to be. After watching that game, it was clear that Illinois was the better coached football team. Ted, their starting quarterback went out on like the third drive of the game. If you didn't get to watch the game, Illinois starting quarterback separates his shoulder and leaves the game. And they bring in a guy that had to transfer from Rutgers because he couldn't get on the field. And they handled it beautifully. They put Art Sitkowski in good situations as a passer. They ran the football. 
They managed the clock. They didn't commit stupid penalties. They were a disciplined, well-coached football team. And the thing that bothered me the most was what I heard from Scott Frost after the game. It, it, he, the line he said, it looked like the same movie. That they were making the same mistakes that they've been making the last couple of years. And then he went on this list of like the mistakes that his guys made. And this is right out of the gate in the presser. He, he talked about the punt return. He talked about the missed PATs. He talked about Martinez's fumble. He talked about all the mistakes that his guys made. And from my experience, Ted, that is not how great coaches handle that situation. The, the great coaches I've been around and the great coaches I hear speak after tough games like that, they put the blame on themselves. Great coaches say, hey, I didn't do enough to have these guys ready to play. This is on me. I've got to be better. I will be better. My players deserve for me to be better. They don't rattle off the list of mistakes their players just made. Now, behind closed doors, you rip their ass, right? But everything in college football starts and stops with the head coach. Everything. That's where it all starts, and it trickles down from there. And I just... I was very unimpressed with how Scott Frost handled that. And I just, I I think it's starting to make sense why they're not very good. I don't think he's a very good coach, man. Because because of exactly what you said. They've got a bunch of slow-ass dudes at the skill positions. And they're still running an offense like they've got speed all over the field. Their quarterback does one thing well, Ted. One thing, and he does it pretty damn well. That dude can run. He can absolutely run. And there was no called QB run game in their plan at all against an Illinois defense that is slow. I'm starting to think he's kind of just a bad coach, bro. Yeah, it's weird that There wouldn't be any called quarterback run stuff. I mean, that's his background. Whenever he was at Oregon, he was dialing it up with uh, Marcus Mariota. Um, When he was at Central Florida, he had tons of quarterback run stuff. It is interesting that they're – that's not what they major in with a quarterback. That That's his his, uh, – He he had the long touchdown run, but – Illinois just caught – got caught in a corner blitz. Guy got caught in the wash – Everyone was turning, running, man coverage, and Martinez just took off. Like, yeah. I, there was no read game. They ran like two triple option concepts. I wrote it all down. I was like, okay, what are, what QB run game are they going to use? Martinez, they got to get him in the rhythm of the game. Like they did none of it early either to get him into the rhythm of the game. I I always feel like running quarterbacks kind of get into a rhythm when you let him run a little bit early, and they did none of it. It blew my mind. Well, usually when you've got a quarterback that can run, the first way you stress the defense is with the quarterback. And then after that, they have to constantly adjust to what you're doing. Um, So I don't know. It doesn't look good. Doesn't look good for Frost. Doesn't look good for Nebraska. If the prodigal uh, son can't come back and and, and bring Nebraska back because – I don't know what else they've got to look forward to now. I mean, whenever he was he was at Oregon, okay, this looks awesome. He's doing great as an offensive coordinator. Let's see if he gets some head coaching experience. Goes to Central Florida, rattles off an undefeated season, looks great. Okay, here we go. We got the guy that we want, the guy that understands our program, that understands the history here, that knows what it means, knows what it takes knows how it's different than a bunch of the other schools out there. And if he can't do it, like who, who else could, or not, not who else could, who else will, who will take that Nebraska job? They, 
they need a guy that has okay so i think there's two ways nebraska can be competitive in the big 10 number one you get a guy that is just a little over the top when it comes to the attitude and recruiting just a little corny man i don't know how else to say it raw raw like a guy that can Go convince some fast dudes that live in Florida or fast dudes that live in California that Nebraska is the place for them. Uh, Scott Frost, I mean, he's he's kind of a he's kind of a cool guy, right? I mean, he's low key guy. He he's not that guy. I don't know who they would go and get that would be that guy, but it's like I feel like you need a guy that can really sell the program. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well. I think that Nebraska needs to be like Wisconsin. Yes. They need to be Iowa State. Okay. And so I talked about this a little bit Friday on the radio show. The perfect coach for Nebraska was probably on the other sideline in their opener with Illinois and Brett Bielema. I loved watching what Illinois did to him. I do. They ran it down their face. That's, I mean, that's the. What he like what he used to do at Wisconsin is kind of what Nebraska's gonna have to be. They're they're gonna have to get the they're not gonna be able to get the super great skill guys, the super fast skill guys. They're gonna have to turn into like they used to be a great offensive line institution. And I don't I don't know. I just I was thinking about it, I was like, they need to try to be Wisconsin could be Wisconsin in the Big Ten. Nebraska needs to try and be Wisconsin. The same type of stuff. They're never going to win a national championship. I, I don't think that, you know, we. I don't think we ever even need to discuss that again with Nebraska. But they could be a legitimate top 25 program if they could replicate what Wisconsin does. Get and, great offensive linemen and become a factory for tight ends. Yep. Do do what Iowa State is doing. Getting two tight ends, three tight ends, mix up the personnel groupings. Do something like that. Now you don't have to, you know, sit in I formation and run power every damn play. I'm not saying that. It's just hell, I don't know why they might as well go back and do what they used to do. I why not? Because the triple know. option is the tool of Satan. That's why, Ted. Don't don't make me have to watch that. I, I well, I hey. It, it's more entertaining to watch someone go out there and catch the the ball on the one yard line on a punt, <laughs> screw everything up that you're like just basic detail football. You know, hey, I, they need to find some type of identity that's Nebraska football. This is this is just the truth from what y'all because I watched every snap of that game at least twice. I w- I was working that DVR, Ted. I was like, okay, I'm diving into this game. Let's see what Nebraska is made of. The only way their guys got open was number one, they got referees murdered across the middle of the field. I mean, that one guy was bleeding out of his ear. Or number two, they were just busting coverage. They, I, I don't recall where I saw a guy just separate from a defensive back from Illinois where I was like, man, that guy burned. Like, they are just slow. So to try to run what they're running offensively when you're slow, it makes no sense. Like, it's it's bad coaching. And they look slow against Illinois. Illinois is one of the worst teams in the Big Ten. Well, here's the other thing, too, is, you know, they had, an, they had the football late with the chance to go down, and they would have to score and get a two-point conversion, obviously. But that two-minute offense that they ran Dude. was horrible. How... How about when they were down multiple scores and using all of the play clock and operating with no sense of urgency whatsoever? They're like, hey, let's go on a nice long extended drive here. I was on my couch downstairs at my house yelling, what are you doing? Go snap the ball. Like, but everyone on Nebraska, it was like, oh, no, we'll just we'll just use this time. We're only down a couple of touchdowns. It's fine. It was once again, it goes back to the coaching. How were they not operating quicker in that situation? Like 
there were so many things like there were so many mistakes made by the players, but also just coaching errors, man. Yeah. It's frustrating. Tough to watch. It wasn't that tough. Oh, he's going to beat the shit out of that team. Yeah, I, I know. I, it kind of sets OU up for failure though. Cause like everyone's expecting them to win by 50. Yeah. Sooners can beat them by four touchdowns and people will be like, mm, did they really play that well? Here's why it's disappointing to me. You know, Nebraska is, they got a big fan base. Nebraska's got a big fan base because it's a program that you, I mean, was elite for a long time. What, what do they do now? I, Nebraska fans are not going, in, in my opinion, they're not going to all of a sudden turn into OU fans or Wisconsin fans or Ohio State fans. My guess is they're going to turn into fans of something else, not college football. And it's kind of the same thing. We're about to talk about UCLA, and I'm seeing screenshots of the the stadium before that game, and it's like, like college football, I, I'm sorry, but it looks like they've got some problems coming for them, you know, because of this consolidation of power, which it's great. Where it's great, it's great. But where it's not great, I think a lot of people are – are about to tune out. I I think Nebraska can be fun and relevant again. I just don't think Scott Frost is the guy for it. I don't. After yeah. watching that game, man, I, I was there were just too many things that didn't make sense to me. It bothered me. That that game bothered me. That's the best way to put it. It looked like a um it looked like fire me now before you fire me for cause later. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's, I don't know. It was bad. Uh, you Did not look UCLA. like a, a football team that was ready for a season. I mean, they no. just didn't. No, I guess those extra workouts didn't pay off. No, not at all. Those are last year. Even too. they're still God. Oh boy, man. I'm sorry, Nebraska fans. Nebraska fans are great, too. I'm so sorry that your team is so bad. UCLA destroyed Hawaii. No, Dorian Thompson-Robinson, he didn't look very sharp to me. He was missing some wide-open guys. I actually was able to interview him after the game. I was doing Sirius XM uh, Channel 84, and he basically was like, yeah, I just wasn't very good. <laughs> I was like, all right, all right, good talk, man. But their their running game was rolling. Now, once again, it's Hawaii. I understand that, but Zach Charbonnet was running through everyone. Uh, the Britton Brown kid looked good. That running game, that, that is something that Chip Kelly always has wanted to be a huge part of his offenses, even going back to those offenses at Oregon. That, that inside zone game is, is huge for him. Now, I, I'm not sure we learned that much about UCLA's defense in that one. That poor quarterback from Hawaii was just getting murdered. But a lot of people think that UCLA is a team that can make some noise in the Pac-12 South, Ted. And they have a very interesting one next week in the Rose Bowl against LSU, which will probably feel like an LSU home game from what, uh, what we just saw. Good what, that Lord. That was crazy. Uh, what, how many people do you think were at that game? Approximately 12. Uh, not 12,012. I, I know that place holds a lot of people, so it can make uh, a, a decent group look like a small group, but I think 12 is close. That was crazy. And people were like, well, school hasn't started, and it's really far away from campus, and it's so nice in L.A. today, and we're all at the beach. And I was like, listen, <laughs> OU is going to be playing Western Carolina next week and there will be 85,000 plus there to watch that snoozer of a game and there's going to be thousands of OU fans that buy it on pay-per-view don't yeah. tell me about how nice your weather is hey this just in people in all of the big cities like all these college towns a lot of them around big cities 
There's shit to do everywhere now. There is. There's LA's not the only place with water, Ted. No. I'll tell they you don't what, like football. They don't care about it. No, they don't. You mentioned the uh, the Western Carolina game. There, right now, we have zero tickets sold for the two lane OU game that may actually take place in Norman. Guess how many people are going to be at that game if the if it switches to Norman? Eighty five thousand, and there's zero tickets sold to it right now. And if it happens this week and they move it to Norman, it'll be a s- absolute sellout. Every single butt or every single seat will be filled. So it's weird, man. I I don't know the Pac-12. And to their credit a little bit, UCLA has sucked for so long that maybe there's no reason to, to show up. But looks like a pretty good football team. They've got experience. They've, they've got some good skill position players. Um, they looked speed, actually man. like they were ready to play a football game in their opener, like some the, uh, unlike some other teams across the country. So, I oh, know they're interesting. It doesn't take a whole lot to to challenge for the Pac-12 right now, and that team looks as about as good as any we've seen out there recently. Yeah, the only thing that has me really hesitant with them is if DTR can't be more accurate with the football. Yeah. They're going to have problems. You're right. They got speed at receiver. I liked what I saw from a couple of their backs. And DTR can run, too, so you add that QB run element to things. But we've seen it. In order to be a you know conference championship-type team, really in any league now in college football, you got to have really good quarterback play. So he, he's got to be better than what he showed in that game against Hawaii. But, yeah, I, I did like what their O-line did. Physical group. I liked it. Okay, Ted, let's move to our winners and losers of the weekend. But first, do you own a business? If you do, you need Insurica in your life. Insurica is one of the country's largest insurance brokers with 30 offices throughout Oklahoma, Texas, and the Southwest. Insurica is able to customize programs by accessing the latest information from many insurance carriers. They compare and contrast coverage offerings and pricing in order to design a cost-effective, comprehensive program to meet your business's specific needs. Insurica's clients become best-in-class businesses by working with Insurica's team of advisors to manage risk. Purchasing insurance is only one way to protect your business. Best-in-class businesses win by avoiding loss in the first place. If your business partners with Insurica, you'll save huge amounts of money and take back control of your total cost of risk. I'm an Insurica client, and you should be too. If your business wants to be best in class, connect with Insurica at Insurica.com. That's I-N-S-U-R-I-C-A.com. And guys, it is summer, and you know what that means. It is hard seltzer season, baby. And there's only one hard seltzer that we drink on this podcast, and that is Will and Wiley Hard Seltzer from Coop Works. Ted, listeners, enjoy Will and Wiley while you can. That's all I'm going to say. Because I think this ad read is getting changed to a Sonic Hard Seltzer ad read pretty dang soon from our friends at Coop Ale Works. So enjoy it, people. Nice. It's perfect for any occasion. We drink it by the pool, at the lake, and at the tailgate. It's made in Oklahoma, and it's absolutely delicious. Will and Wiley is customized for the Oklahoma lifestyle. Go find it right now in a store near you, and go follow them on social media at at Will and Wiley. As always, Ted, kick us off. Who do you have as your winner of the weekend? I had to go with Trevor Lawrence. Uh, It's been a pretty crappy preseason for him so far. He's looked uh, pretty bad at times. Uh, There's been a lot of injuries around him on that team. On that offensive line. The final preseason game, his his best chance to get, you know, uh, some confidence before he's thrown to the Wolves during the regular season. And four of the five starting offensive linemen are out. So Urban Meyer was close to not even playing Trevor Lawrence. And that decision came right up to the game and they decided to go ahead and put him out there to try and get that offense rolling a little bit. And he actually looked pretty good. Uh, What was he like? 20 of 32, 185 yards, couple of touchdowns, um, interception, free football game, looked way more in control, looked way more confident, finally got in, to a bit of a rhythm in that uh, offense. So uh, it was good because what they scored like three points total coming into it. So for that offense to finally get clicking a little bit, even with those four offensive linemen out, 
that's got to be huge for Trevor Lawrence because, man, going into this week, I was starting to get really worried for the kid. You, it, I will say they put a ton of money into that offensive line, and the dudes are dropping like flies. I am, I'm not too worried about it because they've got the Texans in their opener. Now it's on the road in Houston, and it's never easy to go play on the road in the NFL, especially in your NFL debut if you're Trevor Lawrence. But I don't think the Texans are going to be a very good football team. But what is that O-line going to look like? They, that, is, that is a rookie quarterback's best friend, right? A, a talented offensive line and a good run game. I guess we'll see, man. Those, those guys got to get healthy in a hurry. Yeah, you got Cam Robinson, left tackles out with an ankle, left guard, Norwell's out with an elbow, Linder, the center's out with the knee, right guard, AJ can reserve COVID-19 list. Jawan Taylor was the only starter to play. <laughs> <That's>, that... <laughs> that is not good. So, that, especially when you're starting a rookie quarterback, you know, that's just trying to, to figure everything out, out there to have that many starters out is brutal. But it is a pretty good offensive line if they can get everyone uh, healthy and ready to roll. Yeah, and now Trevor's not looking over his shoulder at Garden, Gardner Minshew anymore. <laughs> right. Dell Tempt to the Eagles. I thought that was um, interesting. I, that caught my attention. That certainly caught my attention. All right, who do you have as your loser of the weekend? Uh, I hated this. J.K. Dobbins uh, with the Ravens running back. Goes down with the ACL. Going to miss the season. I It's so brutal when you see guys get hurt in the preseason. And, you know, this is like the classic push and pull between the players and the owners about the preseason, right? We don't need the preseason games. There's no reason to go out there and risk getting injuries. And uh, you have a, a guy like this who... I thought Dobbins was poised to have a breakout season this year. Um, you know, uh, going into year two, look good, look fresh, and uh, you lose him for the year. And I don't know. They've got Gus Edwards there and Tyson Williams. They're going to try and pick up the load, but I don't know how they're going to replace J.K. Dobbins. That's going to be a hit to that football team, and it happens before you even play game, uh, in game one. Yeah, I'm I'm with you. I, I... – he was really effective last season. Mm -hmm. I think he averaged like six yards a carry or something like that last year. Now we'll, we'll see what ends up happening to that Ravens running game, but it, it does feel like it has, it's taken a big hit. Let's just be real. That, that has been such an important part of that offense, right? With what they did in that running game with Lamar Jackson and that group of backs and how they use all those tight ends creatively in the blocking scheme. I, I played in that system. I played in Greg Roman's system. He's going to run. He's going to want to run the football. And if they can't, I, I still don't know if Lamar Jackson is a guy you just want to drop back. I mean, 40 times right. a game. I don't, I, I don't think that's his strength, Ted. So I, I'm with you. The, the Ravens can't, feel great about their running back position it's almost like they're OU or something huh am I right am I right yeah, yeah it's it sucks JK Dobbins uh, was gonna have a good year uh but hey this gives someone else an opportunity to step up we'll see what happens yeah okay are you unhappy with the surface around your pool are you not pleased with your patio soft rock specializes in installing safe rubber surfacing for pools patios gym floors and other outdoor surfaces Soft rocks. Okay. I was supposed to say outdoor spaces. I said surfaces. I don't know. It's not even close to the same word. I apologize. <laughs> soft rock, soft rocks, rubber safety surfacing provides a long lasting surface that is impact and slip resistant, fully customizable and virtually indestructible local business owners, Heidi and Cody Clark are avid OU fans that are driven to help with you, help you with all of your pool and patio surfacing needs. Visit softrock.com slash OKC. That's S-O-F-T-R-O-C dot com slash OKC for more information. The Clarks also own the Driveway Company. The Driveway Company has tailored solutions to eliminate all your driveway problems. 
They can repair cracks, clean and seal your rotting grass-filled joints to prevent water damage, ultimately saving you thousands of dollars in future repairs. Visit thedrivewaycompany.com slash OKC for all of your driveway repair needs. Learn more about Soft Rock and the Driveway Company by visiting their Facebook and Instagram pages or by calling 405-294-9834. And are you looking to buy or sell a house in the OKC metro area? I just used the Ronaldo Cloud Group to sell my old house, and it was so easy and stress-free. Stacia Ronaldo and Maddie Cloud are with Sage Sotheby's International Realty. They believe in prompt communication, an honest relationship, and luxury service. They gave me a free smoothie on Saturday, Ted. True story. At Organic Squeeze, Nichols Hills Plaza. Free that? smoothie from the Ronaldo Cloud Group. Wow. You can reach Amazing. them by emailing Stacia at Stacia at SageSir.com. That's S-T-A-C-I-A at S-A-G-E-S-I-R.com. Or you can contact them on Instagram at, at sold by Stacia and at sold by Maddie underscore. You will not regret using them. Okay, Ted, for my winner of the weekend, I thought about going with Jerry Jones. Hard Knocks has been boring. Right. He's been kind of a highlight, but I thought it was very cool that the Cowboys are letting the New Orleans Saints practice at AT AT&T Stadium this week after being displaced by Hurricane Ida. I just that made me feel good. That hit me in the feels. I was like, look at the NFL. Look at Jerry Jones. That's that's awfully nice. The Cowboys. I that that made me happy. But my winner of the weekend, Patrick Cantlay, a.k.a. Patty Ice, that was awesome. Patrick Cantlay wins the BMW championship in a six hole playoff against our favorite guy, Ted <laughs> Bryson DeChambeau. I bet, I bet you loved watching that. I didn't see it. I was at a, uh, a birthday party, uh, a swim party. So I didn't get to see the close up of this thing, but it sounds like exactly what I would want. DeChambeau okay. losing at the end. Let me paint the picture for you. DeChambeau, last couple ho- holes when he would make putts, you know, like subtle, like fist pumps, like I'm winning, like I- I'm going to win. Even coming up to 18, gave the uh, the hat tip. And he's like waving to the crowd on the side. But probably your favorite thing, uh, the favorite thing for you would have been, I think it was on the 14th hole. DeChambeau's taking practice swings, right? He's about to fire one in, and he he backs off the ball. Cantlay was walking, like, next to him, like, way across the fairway. And he goes, hey, Patrick, can you stop walking? <laughs> and asked him to stop walking. Backed off the ball, asked him to stop walking, but it was it was an awesome finish. It was one of the more fun finishes I can remember in a while it 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 had everything from Cantlay dude I mean ice in that dude's vein veins with the flat stick man it was un it was an unbelievable display of putting drains a 20 footer on the 18th then DeChambeau misses forces the playoff and I was having so much fun rooting against Bryson DeChambeau. Like I was, I was having a ball and the playoff was awesome, right? Goes six holes, but they're going back and forth. Can't lay drains an 18 footer to birdie the sixth hole. He did. He was unbelievable on the greens. I saw a stat that he, he had 14.58 strokes gained in putting this week. 14.58 14.58 strokes gained putting Jeez. the most in a 72 hold PGA tour event since they started tracking that stat in 2004. I wish I was a professional golfer because it would be so easy to screw with the Shambo playing around with him. If you're paired with him, just like little subtle things that probably people can't pick up on just like where you stand like rattling around your clubs or something over there. I mean, oh, it would be the greatest thing ever. <laughs> and while Cantlay putted unbelievably, right? Uh, some just ridiculously clutch putts. Bryson missed some butts on Sunday, Ted, including the one to extend the playoff after Cantlay buried his. And now Patrick Cantlay, fun fact, the only player on the PGA tour 
with three wins this season. And this also earns him, and he would have gone anyways, but earned him the final automatic spot on the U.S. Ryder Cup team. So a solid weekend for our man, Patrick Cantlay. That's awesome. I love it. God, I wish I would have seen that. That is. He'll replay right it on Golf out. Channel. You got to yeah. watch it. You got to watch him back off the ball and tell, ask him to stop walking. You got to, bro. <laughs> it was the most DeChambeau <laughs> thing of all time. Oh, uh, what a dork. It's great. Patty Ice. I love it. Solid nickname, by the way. Okay, so for my loser of the weekend, I thought about going with the Formula One fans, which includes me. Ted set the alarm, got up, drank some coffee, was all settled in to watch the Belgian Grand Prix, and it got rained out, Ted. Rained oh, out. Brutal. And it was, from, from my understanding, Spa, the track, dangerous while dry, deadly while wet. Ooh. So they were doing, the, the safety car was, I basically just watched Mercedes drive around this track for like two hours. And then they did like two laps, eventually completed two laps, and they were just like, all right, we're done. Uh, the winners get half points. And they declared winners. It was it was the damnedest thing I'd ever seen. I was like, wait, and what? Two, so you they ran two laps and... Yeah. Hey. And it wasn't even like full speed. I don't even know how to describe it. They were just like, everyone was saying, because normally you have to, I guess you have to com complete three-fourths of a Formula One race for there to be yeah. points scored. I was like... There shouldn't be points for only two laps. Like they did like two laps as like a uh, a pace lap, and they gave wow, that's that's interesting. It was huh. weird, but I learned more about Formula One in the process, and I also learned that I don't like rain on on race day. I don't yeah. like it. I know it makes things interesting sometimes, but it basically just got rained out. And I know you're dying to know, Ted. Max Verstappen first. Max Verstappen first. Okay. Yeah. He nice. probably would have gotten first anyways. Be have real you good. seen, what's the movie? Um, oh, gosh. Ford it's about, Ferrari. Ford versus Ferrari. No, it's about you the. you seen that uh, movie? It's awesome. Yeah, it's awesome. It's great. It's one of my favorites. I watched it the other night. I've probably seen it 10 times. But there's one about the, uh, the English Formula One racer that was famous. Uh, famous. They're all famous, I guess. And he had like a. Uh, uh, he had a, like a big rivalry with, um, was it an Italian guy and they hated each other. And then there's the race in the rain. Uh, the dude. only, the only British formula one driver, remember very new fan to the sport. Mm -hmm. The only British one I know is Lewis Hamilton and he's still racing and he is. No, this is back like in the seventies when it was super, super dangerous. When guys were like dying all the time in those crashes. Well, people still die, which is no, crazy. I know. Yeah. But I, whenever you find out what movie that is, I'm down to watch. Yeah. I'll send it to you. I think that, Oh God, I can't believe I can't remember the two guys names. It's okay. Dumb of me. No pressure. It's fine. I'll look I it was up about and to, send it to you. Like the only other formula, the only Formula One driver I think I knew growing up was Michael Schumacher, and I, <laughs> I don't think he's English. I think he's like German. <laughs> and I think his kid, his kids in Formula One now. Okay, this has gone very much off the track, <laughs> We're way off the rails. Um, but my loser of the weekend, Tua Tungavailoa. He's been playing well this preseason. Has looked good. They're doing some some more of the RPO stuff where he really thrives. Seen Orlovsky do a couple breakdowns of him. Been very complimentary of the way he is playing. And my Miami's going to have a really solid team, right? But a guy that covers the NFL for Yahoo, Charles Robinson, tweeted that the Miami Dolphins have emerged as the front runner in trade discussions with the Texans for Deshaun Watson, hmm. which made me do a double take, then a triple take. And I was like, wait, what? So Brian Flores was asked about it, said they don't talk about trade speculation 
Now, he did add that he is very confident in Tua and said that he has played very well. And he has. But after what happened last year, Ted, with Tua getting pulled, you know, being in and out of that lineup, there's got to be a small part of Tua Tungavailoa that sees that report and totally believes it. Yeah. And there may not be an ounce of truth to that report, but he cannot be thrilled about that with everything that Deshaun Watson has going on. Right. And it's still kind of crazy how little everyone talks about one of the best quarterbacks in football, just not playing football this year. Like I don't see any way in hell he steps on the field, but I have no idea why a team would trade for Deshaun Watson Right now, I'm sure there would have to be a lot of things built into that trade agreement. But two has got to see this and be like, dude, what the hell? Yeah. Yeah, it is interesting. He's he's come on. I, last year, I felt a lot of people were really disappointed, but I thought he got kind of thrown to the wolves on. You got to give these guys a little bit of time. Uh, I know in some instances, guys step right in and, and do well. Uh, it didn't happen with him, but I think it's a, still a little bit too quick to totally uh, throw in the towel on him, especially for a guy that who knows could be in prison this time next year. So uh, that seems a bit risky for me right now. You, I think you still got time with Tua. Um, they better have some serious in, in, inside information on that court case. If they're going to make that trade. Yeah, I don't believe it, but it's out there. And when something like that is out there, you better believe that Tua saw it. And I can't. God, there's got to be you... something to it. Like there's got to be some type of interest or some conversation has had to have happened. Usually those things don't just get conjured out of thin air. Yeah. And it's, and I'm not saying that Tua is like some, you know, mentally weak guy or anything. I'm not trying to say that, but just really got to bother you. Like you're starting to gain some momentum. You're probably starting to feel like the leader in that locker room. And then mm -hmm. this drops. I just, I can't imagine how pissed off he is. God, that has Brutal. to be so frustrating. Brutal. Yeah. Oof. And on that note, episode 142 in the books, we'll have a new podcast that'll drop Thursday morning. Just a reminder. Our man, Dusty Dvorak, will be joining us to preview OU Tulane. You can hear Teddy from 2 to 6 on, okay, you said you were going to find out what we're supposed to say. 94.7, the ref. Okay, making edit now. 94.7, the ref. So I don't have to say Sports Talk 1400 anymore. You can hit both of them, I guess. I can I, alternate them. Yeah, it's. I guess we're, we'll be fourteen hundred. The ref and ninety four seven. The ref. Oh, so it, the the ref is is the blanket. Yep. Okay. Yep. From two to six on ninety four seven. The ref, <laughs> and you can hear me from three to five on Sirius XM Big Twelve Radio Channel three seventy five. Hope you all have a great week. Until next time, we appreciate you all for listening, and do what you always do, Oklahoma. Take care of each other. <laughs>